Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 16th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show, show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. The show additionally broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, our reaction to a recent op-ed from Governor Walker attempting to excuse his unilateral decision in 2016 to cut the PFD. Second, why HB 331, the oil tax credit bailout bill, sets a dangerous legal precedent for future Alaska legislatures if upheld by the Supreme Court? And third, what last week's legislative hearings into the LNG project said to us about the state of the project? And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Brad Keithley is a former oil and gas consultant. He was an attorney. He is now retired. And in his spare time, holy cow, the guy's busier than I am, uh, he's out there. He helped form Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, which is a group organized to check the growth of the state of Alaska, the mission creep, as it were, and to make things more uh, reliable, relatable, and more. Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How about you? You know what? There's just uh, no complaints. It's just another beautiful day in paradise, I guess is what I'm saying. It's just another beautiful day in paradise. Um, let's uh, let's talk about your weekly top three. That is your, you know, you've got, uh, you've got every week you want to come in and talk specifically about um, different things. We were just talking about Bill Walker and his uh, kind of his track record and where he came from and that whole unity ticket thing. Uh, but you want to talk specifically to begin with about his latest op-ed piece, which I read, and, and I've got to, I've got to say that there's more, there, there's more fiction in that than a, than a, than a uh, J.K. Rowling novel. But I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, his op-ed in the Juno, Juno Empire. Well, basically, uh, Walker's written this op-ed, and and the title of it says what he what he's trying to get at. It says, "Why did I reduce the PFD?" In 2016, you can find the op-ed in the in the Juno paper, in the uh, uh, in the Anchorage paper, in the Fairbanks paper. You can even find it on Jeff Landfield's uh, uh, landmine Alaska landmine blog. Uh, it's all over the place. So if people haven't read it, they should they should take a view at it. And and in the op-ed, uh, Walker tries to justify why he cut uh, the PFD unilaterally uh, by veto um, in in 2016. And basically, his storyline is the legislature made me do it. Um, I didn't want to. Uh, I was trying to get to to another place with uh, uh, with uh, the Alaska's fiscal situation, but the legislature put me in a box, uh, and I had to cut the PFD. Um, and and explaining why he had and and explaining uh, why he had to cut the PFD. Basically, it was the legislature wouldn't give him any other revenues. Um, not that not that they wouldn't cut the budget, although that certainly is a problem from the legislature standpoint. But they wouldn't give him any other revenues. So in order to generate new revenues, he uh, had to cut the PFD uh, in order to pay for the budget. He he goes on to to try to justify why he didn't use those revenues um, in that year. He just left them uh, in the earnings reserve account. Um, but in, in any event, it's that that's the nature of of the piece, right? Well, and again, I, I mean, I, I again the comment that there's more fiction than a than a than a, than a Harry Potter novel, because I mean, really, he continues to 
put forward these these falsehoods. I mean, talking about cutting 44% out of the state budget from 2013. I mean, Shelly Hughes, who's done, I'm not even going to redo her work. She has done an amazing job of busting that number down into reality, when in all reality it's about 3 or 4% instead of 44% when you actually account for it properly instead of with all this, you know, voodoo accounting things that they like to do out there. He talks specifically about trying having to save the dividend because now the dividend was at risk. Well, that's if you only use his fictitious accounting methods that again he put out on that big piece of poster board where he said we just continue to drain the earnings reserve and there'll be no money left for dividends not accounting for the fact that the law says it's a 50 50 split and that money will be continually renewed each year i mean none of these things are brought forward this thing is just so full of holes i don't even know where to begin well it's there's two pieces to this one is did we need additional revenues um, and, and you and I have talked about this a lot on the show. The answer is no, we didn't need to do additional revenues. Yes, he talks about cutting the budget from 40% from the 2013 level. But the 2013 level was an all-time high. It was nearly $8 billion. Now, that compares to you know what we talk about as the long-term sustainable budget of about $4 billion. So the legislature, and this is, this is Republicans that had done it. This was Parnell and... Um, and the and the legislature, the Republican legislature that had run it up, uh, you 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 take it from the all time high, a lar- huge capital budget, uh, and and you say, well, I've cut it from that all time high. Well, I mean, you can you can get big percentages when you do that, but when you look at the operating budget, the amount by which the operating budget had been cut, particularly in 2016. Uh, it wasn't much. Uh, it was it was a few percentage points, and there was definitely more room to go uh, in cutting that budget. Um, so one is the, is is did he need additional revenues? The answer is no. He didn't need additional revenues. The governor, I mean, he showed he had the veto power. The governor could have exercised the veto power uh, to reduce uh, uh, spending down to a level where down to the long term sustainable level that he had talked about during the campaign his 2014 campaign, uh, reduce uh, spending down to that long-term sustainable level uh, and, and achieve, uh, uh, get the budget sort of back, uh, back into long-term balance and, and not have to uh, not have to generate additional revenues. And then the second question is, did he do the right thing? If he needed additional revenues, let's say, let's say for the sake of argument for a moment, did he need additional revenues? Did he do the right thing? Well, in, in, in exercising the PFD, he violated a state statute. Right. I mean, the states, the, the Supreme Court ultimately said, yes, you can do that, uh, uh, but he still violated a state statute. The Supreme Court never said that you didn't violate a statute. Uh, he violated a state statute in cutting the PFD, uh, a statute that says 50% of earnings will be will go to the permanent fund division of the Department of Revenue for for uh, payment out to uh, citizens as permanent fund dividends. So. Did he did he did he need to do it in that way, or did he do it in the right way? One, he violated the statute in doing it, and two, there are other even assuming you need revenues, there are other ways uh, uh, to to generate revenues that he could have worked with uh, the legislature on. The the cutting the PFD, and he knew by then, uh, the ISA report had come out by then. He knew by then that cutting the PFD had the largest adverse effect on the overall economy. Uh, and it had by far was by far the costliest of all the options, all the new revenue options to Alaska families. So he was he he cut the PFD against a, a, as a, as opposed to using other options, cut the PFD in a way that had the largest adverse effect on the overall Alaska economy and had and by far was the costliest to Alaska families. In short, he picked the worst option for generating new revenues. So you know this whole defense of I had to do it. Uh, the legislature put me into a box. Uh, there weren't any other options. The whole defense is just sort of, um, I don't want to use the word made up, but it is sort of made up because he had the option of cutting spending down to the long-term sustainable levels that he himself had talked about during the 2014 campaign. He, he had the option of other revenue. If he, even if you assume we needed other revenues, he had the option of, of pressing for other revenues. And, uh, he violated a state statute in doing it. None of that is is discussed in the article. It's just sort of like, I mean, it's Walker is victim. Uh, right. uh, I didn't want to do it. I, they made I was me do a, it. You know, I'm a good guy. 
I'm a good guy, but they made me do it, and it was necessary to do it. And uh, and and he uses that he uses that approach often, Walker as victim uh, often, and he's using it in this op-ed. I think it's unpersuasive. It, I've seen people write about it and say, well, yeah, he was right. He had to do it. Well, the answer is no, he didn't. There were there were uh, other options in in how to deal with that situation, and he dealt with it wrong. And he dealt with it. To me, the overriding factor is he dealt with it in a way that had the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and was by far uh, the costliest to Alaska families. He made the recession worse for the uh, overall economy, and he made the recession worse for Alaska families. I gotta say, you're being awful generous and kind today, Brad, because when you say you find the argument not persuasive. I'm trying to be generous when I say that it's a work of fiction because I, I just – everything that – he continues to go in here. I mean, I'm just going to read a line. The decision to reduce the PFD was the hardest decision I've ever made. Wah. It impacted many Alaskans, no question about it. Lieutenant By Byron Malott and I believe that the alternative would hurt much worse by endangering the future of the permanent fund. Okay, how? How is it going to endanger the future of the permanent fund? That never said. We just throw it out there because it sounds good. And the dividend long term. Again, utilizing his idea of never putting another dime into the earnings reserve. Sure, the permanent fund would go away, but that's not how the mechanism works. I mean, again, this is just, it's like falsehood after falsehood after, you know, plaintive plea and cry for, oh, oh, poor pity me. This thing is a joke. I mean, you're being really generous. I'm just going to call it like it is. This whole thing is BS. It's just a way to try and justify what he did because he's getting hammered for the fact that back in October of 2014, he said to the you know to the papers, I will never cut the dividend. Oh, the reality set in then. Okay, come on, Jack, seriously. You got bought and paid for is what happened. You, wanna, you wanted to pay off the special interest groups of the public sector, and that's what happened. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> we're, we're, I, I, maybe I am being generous today. Maybe it's the fact the sun's out or something. But it's, something. But it. But it, it. It is. It is disingenuous. How about that? How, okay. All right. That's a little uh, better. That's a little better. <laughs> <laughs> to, to 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 make the argument, he didn't have to do it. He wasn't forced into a corner. If it was, it was a corner of his own making. I mean, the he, he, people were pointing out right and left. We were pointing out. Uh, that there were that there were additional places where the budget could be cut. The budget's been cut. Uh, unfortunately, they're now inflating it back up. But the budget's been cut uh, since that point. That showed that there were additional places that the budget could be cut. Rather than lead uh, and and make, I mean, he talks about having to make the hard decisions. Well, the hard decision would have been to go into the budget and prioritize the state's spending inside of its uh, inside of its revenues. Um, and, and, and again, the PFDs were off the table. The statute said they were off the table. The hard choice would have been to go in and say, okay, we can't afford a three university system. We're going to take it down to two. We can't afford to have every optional Medicaid, um, service that, uh, that the government will pay for. Unlike, you know, it, it, alone among the States to have all these choices. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to reduce them. Uh, we can't afford, uh, to uh, have this oil tax credit program, which was still in its heyday at that point, uh, we're going to we're going to take that down. It, it, rather than go in and make those hard choices um, on the spending side and say we're going to we're going to make this government fit to the revenues it has, um, uh, rather than do that, he took the he frankly took the easy route by 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 violating the statute. And redirecting, essentially taxing the PFD, unilaterally taxing the PFD, and diverting that money uh, back over to government. It, it that wasn't a hard decision. It it was it was a, when you're trying to when you're trying to continue to sustain government above its above its revenue level. That was frankly an e easy decision. He could make it. He did it. The hard decision would have been to go in and and redo government. He's never done that. The legislature has never done that. We have a governor candidate now who says he's going to do it, uh, but that would have been that would have been the hard choice. That would have been a choice that, frankly, I and I think other Alaskans would have stood up and respected and say, "Yes, Governor, you're becoming you're becoming a realist." But to right. take money out of the hands of Alaska citizens to do the thing that had the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and was by far the costliest to Alaska families, right? Uh, that that wasn't. I mean that was that was 
that was a bad decision. It wasn't. It wasn't redoing government in the way that he talked about in 2014. Uh, and I don't think it's a defensible position that he can. Uh, that it, it, as much as he wants to write about, as long as as long of an op-ed as he wants to write, it's just not a defensible position. So I was just talking about before you came on the uh, this oper this uh, this push now by the AFL CIO. Vince Beltrami, organized labor, to try and merge those tickets. You can already see the machinations behind the scenes because they're seeing that this three-way race is not going to be good for them. Um, and I see Walker maybe is utilizing something like this as a way to try and defend his previous position against both Mike Dunleavy and Mark Begish because they have both come out to say that the PFD cut was not necessary. Um, how do you think that this plays out moving forward in that? And do you think that this three-way becomes a two-way in some kind of new unity ticket? Or is this just kind of wishful thinking on the part of Beltrami and company? You know, I, first off, I want to say I think that's hilarious because we were set up for a two-way, right? right Walker right. was in the, Demo the Democrat slash independent primary. Um, and, and, and Begich got into that primary. We were set up for a two-way. Right. We were going to find out who the progressive uh, Democrat slash independent side wanted as their candidate to go up against the Republican candidate. Walker was Walker. You know, the Democrats have bent over backwards to create this opportunity to have independence uh, in their primary in large part to, to give Walker the room to do that when we got to the 2018 election. And then Walker backs out of it. It's not, <laughs> I mean, Walker's the what Walker's the one who's created this three-way race and for, and for Vince to go around saying, Oh, you know, Mark and, 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 uh, 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 Walker need to come to some sort of, you know, understanding and narrow it down to two. They had set up a system to narrow it down to two. Walker didn't want to face up to it, uh, and, and backed out of it. So I don't, I certainly don't think it's incumbent on Begich's part, uh, to, to try to deal with Walker, I mean, all Begich did was comply with the rules. He's running in the Democrat primary. If Walker would have been in the Democrat slash independent primary, we would have found out which, uh, you know, labor could have come in on one side or the other, and we could have found out which uh, which candidate was better. But for but when Walker backed out of that, um, I think that was, I mean, that was, <laughs> I'm sure there's another story about, well, I was forced into it. I didn't want to do it. You know, I'm a victim. <laughs> yeah, it's all um, poor, poor, pitiful me. Look at me. Yeah, but it's but but we, we were there. We were there. Right. We were on our way. We were on our way to a two way. So I I I have a hard time getting all concerned and and upset and 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 uh, and and you know invested in this concept that we got to get it down to two. They had a mechanism. They have a mechanism mechanism for getting it down to two. The fact is, Walker didn't want to Walker didn't want to make that race. Walker didn't want to face up. To Begich. He wants backroom deals. I mean, evidently, he wants backroom deals to, you know, sort of preserve his position. He wasn't willing to face the voters in that Democrat slash independent primary um, uh, to see whether they wanted, wanted to retain him. So I, mean, I, I, mean, yeah, you know, I, I think that's pretty it's pretty obvious why. I mean, again, Bill Walker in a head to head mashup against uh, Mark Begich, who we've heard some Democrats ascribe to the likeness of Christ. Uh, and of course, Bill Walker, not popular amongst both Democrats and Republicans because of his cut on the PFD. I mean, that's a big deal to the rural communities and everything else, regardless of the fact that Malat is an Alaska native and has a lot of sway in that area. I think that that would have been I think it's pretty clear who would have won in that mashup in my mind anyway, uh, and so I think he understood that his only chance for survival was to bow out, but it did put us in this unique position, which I'm quite honestly, I'm loving. I love the idea of this three-way with the two progressives splitting the whole deal on the other side. Yeah, I, I wouldn't get, I will say this, Michael, I don't think that's a sure bet for Dunleavy. I don't think a, a three-way race is a is a sure bet for Dunleavy. I, Begich, Begich has won three-way races before we, we all recall that Tony Knowles won three-way races, actually sure. twice, right. um, uh, when, when you count the Lindauer meltdown and whatever the heck was going on in the Republican Party <laughs> in that second, in wow. that second race. Uh, uh, I mean, the Democrats win, have, have won three-way races in this, in this state. And sure. I can see, you know, Begich with the, PF, with the PFD vote um, uh, and, and with a more moderate position – more liberal position than Dunleavy, I can see Begich forging uh, some sort of plurality um, in a three-way race. So I, I don't think I don't think Begich backs out. 
I think if what it, I think if they want if Beltrami had truly wanted to get it down to two, uh, that that the that the way to do that would have been to say Walker, you need to stand up and you need to run in this primary. You've al- already filed for at that point. Right. That we've gone out of our way to set up. You need to you need to stand up and put yourself to the voters in that primary, and we'll get it down to two that way. I don't. I think the fact that Walker backed out of that and is trying now to broker a backroom deal reflects very badly. Uh, on Walker and I and and you know if I'm baggage I just keep running yeah I just keep running on my on my ticket I keep I keep talking about Walker bailing on the remaining 80 percent giving into the top 20 percent by the PFD cuts um, and and I just keep running uh, on that and I, I you know I those who think that's an automatic lock for the Republican candidate, I think, are wrong. I think we're going to see this polling get a lot tighter as we go along. Oh, and I don't think it's a lock, but I just like our chances. Now, remember, a lot of these other three-way races were two Republicans or two more conservative candidates versus the split on the Democratic side. This is where the shoe is on the other foot, so to speak, if that's the case. So I, I think there's more of a balance. Of, I, nothing's a shoe in for sure, but uh, I, I think it's going to be an interesting time regardless of that. <laughs> let's let's move on to point. I, the, the, go ahead. No, 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 let me let me tell you one more thing about that about where you know you think this is too liberals. The Chamber of Commerce crowd is going to go to Walker in a three. If if Dunleavy wins the primary, yeah, the Chamber of Commerce Republicans are going to go to Walker. They're not going to go to Begich uh, because they're concerned about uh, Mark's position on labor issues. Right. They're going to go to Walker. So okay. we're going to see a split in the traditional Republican. Uh, if, if Dunleavy is the, the nominee, we're going to see a split in the traditional Republican. You're going to find – you're going to see people um, uh, that are normally aligned with the uh, Chamber of Commerce crowd. I wouldn't be surprised if you wouldn't see Meade himself if he loses the primary endorsing uh, Walker as the better choice over Dunleavy. So are they are I they so afraid? Is. Are they so afraid of the of what Dunleavy might do that? I mean, that's where they're at. They're just so terrified of it. Oh, they don't want the, they don't want the PFD back. They, they because they because they see where that leads. I mean, if you if you if the PFD gets restored, what happens is we we, we confront the issue of either uh, cutting government spending more. Uh, or uh, coming up with another form of new revenues. And the other form of new revenues are going to be some form of, of income-related tax. Um, so they will, they will see Dunleavy driving, a situa- driving the position of getting government spending down, or they're going to have to come up with, with other new revenues other than the PFD to pay for it. They don't want either one. They want to keep – the Chamber of Commerce crowd wants to keep revenues up uh, or government spending up because some of them benefit from the capital budget. Uh, some of them benefit from government contracts. Um, some of them benefit from, you know, GCI benefits from government subsidies for telecommunications. They want to keep government spending up, so they don't want to. They don't. They 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 are scared of Mike uh, cutting government spending, uh, and they're also they also don't want to see the PFD restored because then right. they know if they're going to keep government spending up, it's going to have to be there's going to have to be additional revenues, and they see that boomeranging boomeranging back on that. They, I mean, Walker sort of put them in the best position that they can be in. Government spending is still up. They're still getting their contracts. We're getting something of a capital budget um, and, and, and the likelihood of oil revenues recover and we keep PFD cuts in place, additional capital budget. Um, and, and they're not having to pay for it. The top 20% is not having to pay for it because they've shoved the cost of it off on middle and lower income Alaskans through PFD cuts. So, I, Michael, this is, I mean, this is set up for for a Republican split again um, uh, between the Chamber of Commerce crowd and and more conservative Republicans and I, 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 I I'm sure I will say this again additional times during the fall I'm not sure Begich doesn't squeak through uh, in in that situation. Well, it is. There's a there's a court case. It's been challenged in court uh, by 
uh, some citizens down in Juneau saying that it's unconstitutional uh, that the that the use of that, that this form of paying for the uh, oil credits is unconstitutional. They're relying on Section 8 of Article 9 of the Constitution, which says, no state debt shall be contracted unless authorized by law for capital improvements or unless other authorized by law for housing loans for veterans and ratified by a majority of the qualified voters of the state who vote on the question. Their argument is that it violates uh, that sentence because it wasn't ratified by uh, by the voters. Now, that's, we, we've talked a lot about why I think these credits, these particular credits are bad and why I think that using bonds to cover these credits are bad. But, but this issue, this issue is much more broad than simply focused on the oil industry and these oil credits. Um, and this court case is going to, is going to bring out, uh, sort of bring that to a head. Here's what's going on uh, in, 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 with the oil credits. The, the legislature had a statute which said we will pay a certain amount of credits of subsidies uh, to certain oil producers uh, if, the, if these or oil companies if these oil companies uh, do certain things. That was in a statute. The legislature this session said we're not paying those credits fast enough. We have an obligation to pay them under the statute. We're not paying them fast enough. So we're going to go out and issue these bonds to enable us to pay off these statutory obligations uh, faster. And, and they and others cite some exceptions to the general rule um, of, 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 the, of the first sentence of, of Section 8 um, and, and cite, that, cite these exceptions as supporting um, the argument that they can go out and issue these bonds. I, I, I don't think these sec the, the exceptions apply, uh, and certainly the people you know, that are pursuing the case down in Juneau don't think these don't think the exceptions apply. But let's let's sort of set all that aside. Let's assume for the moment that the court decides that the that the legislature can actually do this, that it can that it can set a statutory obligation. That if it's if the legislature concludes it's not paying that obligation fast enough, it can set up another entity um, uh, to go out and issue bonds. And pay off and, and generate bonds, generate money from the bonds, and then pay off those obligations uh, separately from the bonds, and in doing so, kick the costs uh, down the road. We're doing it in the oil context, but let me suggest that that a decision by the Supreme Court that says this is okay, this sort of form is okay, is just going to open Pandora's box. Right. Another place, another place that we have statutory obligations is on Medicaid payments. <laughs> and and it is not it is not a far leap for a future legislature facing a budget crunch to say you know what we got these statutory obligations on Medicaid we don't want to pay them we don't have enough money to pay them we're not going to pay them fast enough any everything they've said on the oil side we're gonna we're gonna have problems paying these we want to go we want to set up this separate corporation and go issue some bonds to get the money to pay these Medicaid, these statutory Medicaid obligations. And we're going to follow the same route, the same procedure, the same exceptions uh, that we used uh, in, setting, in, in setting up the, the bonds for the oil credits. If the courts confirm that, we've just opened a giant loophole in how this state funds itself. Right. The legislature is, essentially is going to be able – to, 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 to slough off any annual obligation that they want that's set up by statute, and that's K-12, um, um, uh, 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 Medicaid, probably you could argue the university, you could ar probably argue a lot of other things, are set up by statutory obligations. The legislature is set, has set up a mechanism to go out and fund those by bonds. So instead of using a billion dollars um, or $700 million dollars to pay off the Medicaid obligations, uh, what the legislature would do is ha issue bonds to pay that seven hundred million dollar in seven hundred million dollars in, in any year, slough that seven hundred million dollar bond obligation off on future uh, Alaska generations, uh, and have seven hundred million dollars basically sort of to do something else with right. uh, if it wanted to, because it's paid Medicaid by bonds. That there is no distinction 
but believe me, I, 35 years as a lawyer, I've figured out all the tricks. There is no distinction between between the arguments they're making on the oil credit side and the arguments that a future legislature would make uh, in in setting up a mechanism like that to pay off Medicaid or to pay off K through 12 uh, in any given year and kick that year's obligations uh, down the road to future to future legislatures. You know who's done that before? The state of Illinois. <laughs> right. Right. And, and and you can see the consequences of that. You know, five years down the road, when all these bonds start coming due, it's just a nightmare. Uh, uh, that the taxpayers at that point in time are suddenly being asked to to pay for all sorts of things that got sloughed off on them by by previous legislatures. So this uh, the oil credit bond is I think it's bad enough that we're doing it with respect to. To these particular obligations, I don't think we have to. I think it's 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 bad to slough these these payments off on on future Alaskans to pile on, and sort of the I've talked about as the fiscal toxic waste dump uh, of the 2020s and the 2030s, where we've pushed a bunch of uh, of retired person tourist costs. Now we're going to push these costs. I think it's bad enough to do that with respect to these oil and gas costs, but but they're setting up a precedent, you know. Give us a Democrat governor. Give us a a, a, a Democrat uh, leaning legislature, or heck, give us a legislature that just doesn't want to make the hard choices of of cutting spending and and decides to use this back door to uh, to to go out and uh, and issue bonds and and cover current costs because that way they can kick it down the road to to future Alaskans. The 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 founders, those who drafted the Constitution, had something in mind. When they wrote this sentence, no state debt shall be contracted unless authorized by law and ratified by, by a majority of the qualified voters of the state who vote on the question. The, the drafters of the Constitution wanted to put uh, a, a, a huge speed bump in the way of incurring any state debt, and that right. speed bump uh, would be it has to be authorized by law and it has to be ratified by the voters. The legislature – in 331, uh, though they think they're trying to confine it down to just this one instance, is create is 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 creating uh, a bypass on that speed bump. If the courts approve it, uh, I think we're I think we've just changed fundamentally changed uh, the way uh, the way the state uh, the state's fiscal structure operates, and I think we fundamentally opened the door to huge problems. Uh, going down the road. Well, and I, and I think you've already seen that the legislature has a proclivity for this. I mean, you talked about, you know, the Medicaid payments, the uh, obligatory uh, ma- Medicaid payments. We've already seen them try to bond the debt for PERS and TERS. You've already seen that discussion. So what happens if we do that? What happens? I mean, again, it literally would be the Pandora's box of this whole situation where if you make that if you make that happen, they go, mm, OK, let's just do it all. They'll just start bonding and again, kicking the can down the road. And unfortunately, it's cumulative. And so all of a sudden you'll have billions and billions of dollars that are all going to be coming due down the road. We're literally selling out our children's future for the benefits of a few today or for keeping the status quo as it is today. And, and that is the biggest problem. And I, and I know, I, I know these Valley legislators who were the, who were the, 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 the crucial votes that, that put 330, 331 over. I know these Valley votes, uh, Valley uh, representatives were thinking, okay, we're going to help out the oil industry, but I, but, right. but, they weren't thinking about the long-term impact of what they were doing. This isn't a bill that you can confine to just the oil industry. This is, if anything, uh, this may be uh, a Trojan horse uh, that some people are using to, to get that door cracked open and to find a way to, to let the legislature essentially self-bond um, uh, going forward for a, a, a large variety of things. And I, and I, and I think, I would hope, that the Valley legislators, if they realize that, and we're talking about Delana Johnson and George Rauscher and, and, and Kathy Tilton uh, and, and Colleen Sullivan Leonard, I, I would hope that if they, if they sort of focused on that, they would say, oh, geez, maybe we shouldn't have done this. Uh, I would hope that, that their thought is confined, to, uh, is confined to the oil industry, and that was the reason, that was the reason for their votes. But this, when, we go to, when this goes to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court's really not going to care. It's about the oil industry. Supreme Court's going to be focused on whether this you can use this as a bypass 
uh, for Article One, for uh, uh, Article Nine, Section Eight, uh, first sentence. And and if the Supreme Court finds you can use it as a bypass, uh, we're going to see this show up in all sorts of other things. So it's it, it is it, we have created a monster here uh, that hopefully the Supreme Court will shut down. Hopefully this litigation will. Uh, will enable the Supreme Court to sort of peer off the abyss and see where this otherwise leads us and shuts it down. But if they don't, uh, those who voted for 331 just created a huge Pandora's box that, uh, that's going to come back to haunt us uh, for years to come. Programming note tomorrow, Joe Geldhoff, who is the attorney representing uh, Mr. Roro in uh, Juno on this case, is going to be here on the program. Uh, he'll be uh, representing that case and also talking about defending the PFD, so that should be an interesting program as well. Um, I don't know if people still get this, Brad. Uh, I mean, I talked with people like Tammy Wilson who voted for it, and uh, and she just seemed aghast when I started throwing numbers out there like the potential for an additional billion dollars in costs, you know, and even – you know, even best case, it's going to cost you a couple hundred million more. And uh, that just seemed like there was a lot of uh, numbers games going on when this whole thing was in was in process. And so I don't know if even today uh, a lot of these legislators who voted for it are getting the full ramifications of what this means down the road. Uh, I think only people who've been listening to this program and others where you have talked are, are probably getting the full the full picture of it. Yeah, it's a, it's. I, I mean, this legislation. I, I recall a conversation with Kara Moriarty at the beginning of the session, uh, where she said, "Yeah, this this bill isn't going to go any place. The real fight is going to be whether we can, you know, fend off oil taxes." This bill sort of came on late. Uh, it was there. The governor filed it early, but it sort of came on late uh, in the sense that uh, it was there was an issue about whether or not the state was going to pay the full statutory minimum obligation uh, on these oil credits, and people started viewing this bill as a way of end-running uh, that issue and sort of viewed it in that isolation, and it just it sort of took off quickly, uh, got through House resources, then got through House finance uh, with some amendments, and then the Senate was just happy as heck to, uh, you know, to, to, to approve it. So it, it really I, it didn't get vetted. Uh, in the way that a bill normally would if it was given serious consideration from the beginning of the of the session. I think we would have surfaced uh, uh, whether the bill was the right way to approach the oil credits issue in the first place. And more importantly, I think we would have surfaced these precedential issues if the uh, if the if the bill had had uh, had had a more thorough vetting. I, I know I know the, the 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 Republican legislators, particularly the Valley Four that voted for it, uh, were thinking they were doing a good thing uh, for the oil industry. I've seen them defend it that way, but it's but this has much bigger ramifications uh, than simply oil. I mean, I can vision as, as as I've said, this is a bill that I think ten years from now we're going to go. Oh gosh, this was the one that that opened that opened the door to all sorts of bad things. Um, and I think if this bill makes it through the makes it through the Supreme Court, that's exactly what's going to happen. We're going to see this as the as the beginning point of the way to end around the limitation on the issuance of state debt, uh, and uh, and and a huge opportunity for those who who want to throw more money at current problems and push the push the costs off on the future Alaskans. A huge opportunity for them uh, for them to do it. Brad Keithley is our guest. He's the founder of Alaska's for a Sustainable Budget. We're talking about his weekly top three. That was number two, HB 331, probably one of the most dangerous bills that we've seen come out of the legislature in the last couple of years. Uh, we need to move on now, though. We're running out of daylight here, so we need to get on to the third of his top three, which has to do with the Alaska Natural Gas Pipeline. Yeah, we talked la on last week's show about uh, the LNG hearing that was going to be held that was held last week. We talked about it before the hearing was held, and I sort of ran through a quick list of the things that I would be listening for uh, to see uh, uh, to see what the progress was on the project and whether I thought that, at least in my opinion, the project was going in the right direction. As I described it on the show, then this is these these hearings, legislative hearings are sort of when the iceberg surfaces. You see a little bit uh, of, the, uh, of the LNG project. You get a little give and take about what's going on with it. Most of the time, the LNG project is sort of, sort of continuing below the surface, and you don't have an opportunity to get a good uh, insight into it. Um, the, the, the questions were, were okay. The answers were sort of okay. The, the conclusion I came away from 
uh, after after uh, following the hearing and going back and looking at the materials and listening uh, to the pot to the uh, video of the hearing and, and reading the articles on it, the conclusion was we're, we're sort of on in a way we're sort of on hold. There's a lot of work going on, but until we get a market firmed up and until we get financing worked up, uh, everything else is sort of is sort of sitting there pending. There's a FERC process underway. Uh, but there's issues with the FERC process that haven't been resolved. Uh, the state has a the AGDC has an obligation to do some additional work uh, around uh, its selection process for Nikiski as opposed to Matsu uh, for the for the landing spot for uh, for the location of the gasification plant, uh, the landing spot of the project. The, they haven't really completed that. FERC's sort of on hold uh, in a way, waiting on that. They're progressing on other things, but but not on that. There wasn't a lot of indication in the hearing that that there's been uh, a lot of progress on uh, how they're going to approach uh, putting together the contract packages uh, with contractors that you need for FID. That's probably a good thing because my point all along has been you need somebody with experience like an Exxon or a BP uh, or Conoco uh, deeply involved in that process process when you're putting together those packages. So I, the sense I got from the hearing was we're sort of gliding along, waiting on the China issue to resolve, waiting on uh, those contracts to sort of resolve themselves, waiting on uh, the financing package to sort of come together, and then there, and then we will have another uh, uh, splurge of activity. That's, that's okay uh, in the sense that we're not going down the wrong road. Um, it's sort of disappointing in the sense that we're not progressing, uh, frankly, as fast as, uh, as, as we would want to if we're going to have this project go live in the early 2020s. But I'm not sure that's AGDC's fault. I think, I think the, current, the current situation is created by the whole trade dispute with China and, and China not really um, uh, being in a position to make the commitments that need to be made to, to bring, this, bring this project sort of make a huge step forward with this project. So it, if, if, this was, if this was an opportunity to sort of see the, the surface, the iceberg surface or the project surface for a little bit, uh, it, was, it was a view that we're, we're, still, we're still progressing, but we're progressing at a slow rate, and we haven't, we haven't hit that Y in the road where we, where we either are sort of accelerating into a success story or we're accelerating into a disaster story. Uh, we're sort of just still loping along, trying to uh, trying to get all of the the pieces together. Harold in the chat room says there are 15 to 18 projects in process across the world. Many are far ahead of Alaska LNG, Shell, and BC. LNG is good to go. Keith Myers Old Company is progressing. Cutter is moving to expand their supply. All these things means the price won't be adequate to attract any financing for Alaska LNG. Uh, you know that market and that industry better than most. What what say you on that? Well, this is this is a discussion Harold and I have often uh, on both social media and and through you on this show. And the right. and the answer is there is a success path uh, for the Alaska project. And frankly, as Alaskans, we should want it to be on that path. I mean, Tim Bradner had a great uh, uh, piece in the uh, in the Anchorage Daily News uh, this past week, uh, uh, where he was uh, recounting a, a conversation he had with. Uh, one of the ICER economists sort of looking to the future and what, what was out there on the horizon that sort of ignited, kept the, kept the, the Alaska economy going. Uh, and Tim came to the conclusion that, uh, that Alaska LNG is pretty much, you know, the, the, the big dog uh, in that effort. Charles Wolforth had a column uh, over, the, over the weekend or in the last couple of days that sort of, you know, looks at, at Tim's column and, and looks at Charles' view of the economy and, and sort of generally comes to the same conclusion. We should want, as Alaskans, we should want the LNG project to be successful. And frankly, there is a success path uh, to, to, to make this project successful. It depends on China. It depends on Chinese investment, the Chinese sort of locking in, putting money in the ground over here. So you have a firm, firm sense the Chinese are going to go forward with this project. You don't want you, – you, when you have an LNG project, you want customer money uh, in the ground. You don't want them having the ability to run off with you and, 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 and go to some other project. You want them to have, have a, a money in the ground so they have an incentive to, to stick with the project. There, and there's a success path to make this project work. We have advantages uh, with the Alaska uh, LNG project, and, 
and you can you can make them come to ground. Yes, I mean if I if I want to describe a situation in which in which Alaska doesn't succeed, I can I can put together a long list of things as Harold just did uh, that does that. But there is a success path. As Alaskans, we should want that success path uh, to be the one uh, that we're on. Uh, it's just going to – it takes a lot of things uh, falling together, and hopefully uh, if we keep pushing on them, uh, they're going to fall together. The the, the storyline of, of the hearings last week, though, was we don't know that they're falling together yet. Uh, the, the, trade, the trade dispute with China has put a lot of things, hung them up in the air. Uh, I think if that fell – if the trade dispute was resolved uh, in a way that that got Chinese the Chinese excited and making investment in this project, this project goes because with that sort of backing behind it, we'll find the way to, to get the other dominoes to fall together uh, and get it to be successful. But until that happens, uh, we're just going to sort of continue to churn out there. Well, and I think that re- actually leads me to my the, the, the next question on this, which is, uh, you know, the, the trade tariffs and the tariff war that we're facing now with China is, uh, you know, it's not specifically targeting LNG. I mean, we're seeing a lot of things in like uh, commercial fisheries and, and imports for fish and other things and other resources. But that's still going to have the, the, the bleed over and backlash from that is still going to affect how we handle this gas process, right? Yeah, exactly right. The Chinese, I mean... As I said, we want the Chinese to put money into this project. Successful LNG projects have customer investment. The reason you have customer investment, the reason you want customer investment, is so they have an incentive to stick with the project. Uh, they have they have they have a stake in the ground that they have to protect, and they continue with the project. So successful projects have uh, customer investment. We want Chinese uh, investment, uh, significant Chinese investment. Uh, in this project, we don't want them to have the ability to run off to some other location. We want them to have money in the ground uh, uh, here uh, here in Alaska with this project. They're not going to do that. I mean, e- even though LNG is not part of the, the tariffs right now, the Chinese are not going to put money into the U.S. until they're certain how, how, they're, how the, the trade relationship between China and the U.S. is going to go. I mean, you could you could see a situation. The Chinese would would think about this, and they go, "Well, you know, we'll put we'll put money in the ground in Alaska. We'll 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 build all this project, and then some president's going to impose a 25 percent tariff on exports of LNG to China, and all of a sudden, a project that we thought was going to cost X is now going to cost X plus 25 percent. So they're they're not going to make this commitment, even though LNG is not part of the list right now. They're not going to make this commitment until we get the trade relationship between the U.S. Uh, and the China uh, pulled out of the air and sort of concrete uh, back on the ground again. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm following the, the the trade dispute closely now because of its effect on LNG, and I'm not sure we're going to get that trade dispute uh, resolved anytime soon. It seems to be becoming bigger rather than trending toward uh, toward a conclusion. But it has... It has to be because because we count on Chinese invest because we count on customer investment. It has to be resolved before we're going to be able to get this project uh, significantly progressed. Well, and and just for a second, put on your national based hat and let's talk for just a second about the ramifications of that tariff not being uh, not being clarified. Because I mean, you know, the last thing we need Chinese investment not just in Alaska LNG, but Chinese investment across the country. Uh, the fact that they're the ones that buy a lot of our debt. I mean, they're they're. There's a huge, there's a huge potential here for this thing to uh, powder keg and go and and go really really bad for us as a nation, and it just seems like there is no real um, thought to that, in my opinion. I mean, in the long run, it just seems to be kind of like a pissing contest at this point. I mean, your thoughts? Well, I, I, yes, there there is a real potential for it to go real bad. I, you know, I. I am I'm trying to figure out the Trump administration's uh, game plan for how this gets resolved. Basically, we've got a war within the administration between those who simply want to reconcile or, or remedy the trade imbalance, the huge trade imbalance in goods, <coughs> by increasing Chinese purchases of, of American goods. Uh, those who those within the administration who are willing to do that, and others in the administration who want fundamental reform in China. Uh, basically. What that group in the administration wants, and this is Peter Navarro and, and Leisinger, the, the trade rep, 
What that group wants is China to become an open market. They want they want it to become a capitalistic market like the U.S. So it's free, open, and transparent. You can make uh, uh, investments. <coughs> excuse me. You can make investments in China uh, in the same way that you make investments. Uh, American companies can make investments in China in the same way they make investments in the U.S. That they're treated on the same when they make investments in China, they're treated in the same way as Chinese companies. They want fundamental reform of the China of the Chinese markets. That. Is that is a long way uh, away, and in the meantime, while this while this war is going, or while this while we're sort of escalating up uh, to to bring pressure on each other, uh, yeah, a lot of things could go a lot of things could go bad. Tariffs are are going to increase costs to American consumers. They're going to limit uh, consumer choice in America, drive prices up. Uh, it's going to have uh, adverse consequences. The economists uh, uh, are already saying. That that if if we assumed that there was going to be a spur to the American economy uh, as a result of the tax cuts, that that has the potential to be wiped out uh, by the trade war and the increased costs that, that that get imposed on the economy as a result of the trade wars. So it it, it would be good to get this resolved uh, quickly, but but there's not a clear signal. There's not there's not a clear single message from the administration. Of what it's going to take to resolve it. At some point, I think, uh, as he does, the president's going to say, you know, we're going to cut a deal, and and here's the terms we're going to cut the deal on. We're going to signal that to the Chinese, and 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 hopefully, in some fashion, we will get to resolution on that. But, you know, right now we've got these two warring camps, and it's not entirely clear what we're trying to signal to the Chinese. Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, let's sum eight for this week, things we need to be watching for coming into next week. We're down to the last, you know, four weeks, four or five weeks now before the primary. What do we need to be doing? Who do we need to be talking to? What are the questions we need to be asking? I, 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 it goes, to, goes back to me. I, you've got the charter of changes, which I think is a per, perfect point for uh, uh, the start of any of these discussions. Uh, change the players, change the funding change the location um to me the fundamental question is uh, continues to be how do we, what's your vision of the alaska economy in five and ten years don't tell me about what you're going to do tomorrow tell me what your vision of the alaska economy is in five and ten years tell me what your vision of of of, of government's role in getting there and government's role once we get there tell me what the budget looks like tell me what uh, the revenue uh, picture look the state revenue picture looks like, and tell uh, what your vision of what the state revenue picture looks like, and tell me what your vision of the of the state spending looks like. Um, and to me, that's that's the important question. If they say, "Oh, we're going to increase oil, and oil's going to solve everything," they're not being realistic. So, right. you know, in terms of, you, you really can't trust uh, what they're saying because because we're going to find <laughs> out that's not realistic. Then then they're going to have to do things. Uh, uh, you know, make other decisions, and they they won't have told us what those decisions are going to make. So that's that's the key question. Tell me where we are in five and ten years, what it took us to get there, and what we're like uh, when we get there. Yeah, a big part of it has to revolve around uh, uh, reducing government spending, reducing the the size and scope of government uh, further, and a big part of it has to revolve around uh, what we're doing with the PFD because the PFD is, as ICER has told us repeatedly. Uh, is is a key component of the overall Alaska economy. Uh, tell me what you're doing on the PFD, and then yeah. if if we can't get government down, tell me what you're going to do uh, on the revenue side. Those, those those are the questions we need to continue to ask. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You can find them on Facebook. Uh, in fact, I've got links up in the description of the video here today. You can follow links to both Brad's page and to Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget page. Brad Keithley, thanks so much for coming on board today and talking with us. We appreciate you being part of it. As always, look forward to talking to you again uh, next week. Michael, thanks uh, as uh, for having me, as, as always. And I look forward to the conversation as well. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.